Hi. Welcome to this talk. Uh, this talk is inspired a little bit by my having broken my foot and decided I'd use the time to write a book. So I've named the talk the same thing, Thorium, Energy Cheaper Than Coal. And the idea of that name is thorium is an element that people are not familiar with. Energy is a critical issue. Cheaper implies some economic analysis. And coal sort of reminds us of the uh, pollution problem that we have. Coal emissions, according to the EPA, cause at least 13,000 deaths in the United States alone. This is from particulates that are nucleated around uh, SO2 emitted by the coal plants. These uh, particulates less than 2.5 microns in diameter penetrate the lung tissue and, and cause uh, lung problems and eventually death. Uh, the, we get off lucky. Hundreds of thousands of people die annually in China from this. The UN says almost a million worldwide. So coal is a big problem. It's also a problem for global warming. My own concerns about global warming are based on the impact on water and food. Here's an example of the Rungbuk Glacier in the Himalayas, uh, two shots of it many years apart. What glaciers do is attract or store water during the winter and release it during the summer so that there's a constant water supply year round so that you can continue to grow food. Without water, it's very difficult to raise food. That's the, my, my concern about global warming. Here at Dartmouth, back in 72, uh, 40 years ago, Dennis Meadows, who was a Thayer School professor, uh, wrote this book, Limits to Growth, sponsored by the Club of Rome. And uh, here are the graphs for those people who've been here before. That's on an old-fashioned Model 35 teletype writer with a colored ribbon and a pin printer. The, uh, so you see the blue curve is the depletion of natural resources that he has projected. Uh, the green curve is the population of the US, or of the world, which would grow and then crash due to the lack of food and the increase in pollution. Um, Although he was widely ridiculed at the time, because our history has always been that we've been able to use technology to get around these problems, in fact, we've been pretty much tracking his predictions to date. Resource competition also applies directly to food. Over 90% of all the predatory fish, the large fish in the ocean since the 1950s are now gone. The population of these fish is much less. We eat, uh, we eat them all, and we become much more efficient at catching them. Uh, that has allowed our population to soar. Resource competition for energy is another problem that sometimes leads to war. This is 1990 in Kuwait with the oil fields of fire uh, set afire by the Iraqis and uh, help coming from the US here. Now, population is an issue, but there's a bit of a solution here. This is a graph taken with data from the CIA, the US Central Intelligence Agency. Each one of those dots represents a nation, and the two axes are children per woman on average, and GDP per capita, which is closely related to income per capita. So you can see just by eyeballing the plot that the poorest countries are the ones that have the most children per woman, or perhaps the most children per women have the least income. So when you look at that, we say, wait a minute. The stable replacement rate for population is about 2.3 children per woman, according to the population scientists. So if we look at that right away, we say, wait a minute. Those countries that seem to be wealthy are also the ones that have stable or shrinking populations. Even the US is right about on that red line. Our population growth is largely due to, uh, to immigration. So let's look again at what kind of income level seems to separate these two classes. And I drew an arbitrary line at about $7,500 
of GDP per capita per year here. And that's a, that seems to indicate, to me at least, that all those countries on the right are really below that prosperity level. And if we could somehow increase their prosperity, we might be able to have them be more uh, less fertile. Uh, the, the, the reason that they have so many children in the developing poor countries is that they need children to look after their parents in their old age. They don't have social security. Uh, they need more children because people die more often. They need children because they need labor in the field. But if we can somehow uh, increase the GDP or the income, then women in particular get time. They get time off, so to speak, because they can make use of electric energy. This is a plot of kilowatt hours per capita versus GDP per capita, and it's closely related. This is the specific form of energy, electricity. And with electricity, uh, people can uh, use it for water purification, for sanitation, for communications, refrigeration, heating, cooling, uh, in the industry, transportation. It is the critical resource for any developing nation. To the extent that women are relieved from the duties of hauling water, uh, of uh, foraging for food, and so on at home, they can have time to study, become educated, read, write, get a job, get some income, become somewhat independent, and make personal choices about reproduction. That's the mechanism by which the more wealthy countries generally have a, a stable population. Now, this is all known to the developing countries. They want to increase their prosperity, and they're going to do it. Here's the projections from the US Energy Information Administration. And you can see that the red lines, the non-OECD nations, show more energy growth. OECD is the Organization for, for, uh, uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's the wealthiest nations of the world. But our energy growth is not nearly so strong. And they're going to do it by burning coal, because they're poor. They need to have the least expensive source of energy to drive their development. Again, from the EIA, you can see already the vast difference in projections about coal burning. But even the OECD nations are projected at this time, in 2008, to have flat or slightly growing uses of coal power. We want that, that not to happen. Now, there's a movement afoot for carbon taxes, cap and trade, things of that nature to make, it, make incentives for people not to pollute with coal, but to develop new technologies. But here's, a, here's Professor Sachs, who runs the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He's also the guy who was the chief economic advisor that, for Bolivia, Poland, and Russia to turn their economies around. He is the leader of the UN Millennium Development Project that is designed to eliminate poverty in the world. He's a special advisor to the UN Secretary General. He's an economist, and he says, taxes aren't enough. We need a new technology. Not only that, when that technology is developed, it has to be exported and installed in the developing world. China is another example of a country that's developing. And they, too, say, we need technology to solve this problem. They won't agree to a carbon tax. And here's the reason why. They say, wait a minute. Look, you in the US emitted cumulatively about 1,000 tons per person of CO2 into the atmosphere. And we made, did much less. The wealth of the Western nations is derived from the cheap energy they got from burning coal and putting the CO2 in the atmosphere. And we in China want not to be prohibited from doing that because it's unfair to us. My point of this is not to argue for China, but to point out that getting consensus on this carbon tax or cap and trade is not possible. We've tried to do it. We've had a series of 
conferences, and these are just a few of them. They all failed. Durban failed. 30,000 people went to Durban, South Africa to negotiate a climate treaty. You know already that's going to fail. <laughs> Nations resist climate taxes. So we need energy cheaper than coal. If we can do that, if we can undersell coal, then we can convince all the nations of the world to use it because it's in their economic self-interest, even if they don't care about pollution or uh, carbon uh, dioxide, global warming, and so on, they will accept the economically beneficial alternative, cheaper than coal. So I said this is about cheaper than, and we're going to go through a little bit of cost analysis. Uh, we're going to talk about coal for a minute and then the other sources of energy and see how much they really cost about. This is a kind of a simple model. And in our simple model, we talk about capital cost, fuel, and operations. The capital cost for coal, according to the EIA, is about $2.84 a watt to build a coal plant. That means if you wanted to build a coal plant that would produce, let's say, 1,000 megawatts of electricity, you be, should be prepared to pay about $2.8 billion. Okay? So this is just the cost to build the capital investment that's needed to produce that amount of power. Then I said, get out your uh, tuck school manual or your financial calculator and say, wait a minute, if I want to recover that capital cost, and I, I picked 8% as an, as an uh, investment objective, and run that plant 90% of the time and divide by the number of kilowatt hours, that's about 2.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, it's easy to remember because $2.80 a watt is 2.8 cents a kilowatt hour. So that is the capital cost recovery that must uh, happen if we're going to have people to invest in these. Coal costs delivered to the power plant about $45 a ton. If you divide by the BTU and so on, you find out that the cost of the fuel is about 1.8 cents per kilowatt hour. I made a statement that operations cost about a penny, and that's about right. Uh, I didn't change that in any of the other examples I'm going to give you. That's a constant. So that says the cost of coal today would be about 5.6 cents per kilowatt hour generated. The pretty picture on the left-hand side is the only integrated gasification combined cycle coal plant in the United States in Florida. It is the holy grail of the people who want to do carbon capture and sequestration. Because the first thing you have to do is to capture the CO2. And to do that, instead of burning the coal in air, you burn it in oxygen. So you have to have an oxygen refiner in the front end. And on the back end of the plant, uh, you have water and CO2 coming out, making it possible to separate them. But uh, it costs, uh, where's the price? Uh, PowerPoint different. Anyway, it costs about 4.6 cents uh, to get an IGCC plant running in the United States. And that's without the carbon capture. That's just to build the, the IGCC plant. Sorry, the thing went away. Natural gas is a very interesting subject because it's in the news a lot. We're entering the golden age of natural gas. It's cheap. It's going to be our energy solution of the future. Well, here's the costs. First of all, a natural gas plant has a much lower co capital cost. It's down to about $1 a watt. A combined cycle gas turbine natural gas plant uh, is really 60% efficient. It's a very a efficient scheme to take the thermal energy from burning natural gas and making electricity from it. Here, I said the fuel cost in my model was going to be about $5 per million BTU. Uh, people say, Bob, no, you're wrong. It's only 3 or 350 right now. But I'm going to explain why I think that's going to go up a bit. But at that rate, 2.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Operation's the same. 4.8 cents for natural gas electricity. And the little diagram shows you uh, uh, an idea, a cartoon of a fracking operation on the left and a more standard uh, natural gas dome on the right. But if, in fact, natural gas persists at $3 a million BTU, uh, then we'd have to beat 
3.7 cents a kilowatt hour to undersell natural gas. Tough, tough. On the other hand, most natural gas turbines are not combined cycle turbines. They're mostly what's called a combustion turbine. And they're much less efficient, half as efficient. And therefore, their bogey is about 7.3 cents per kilowatt hour. That's the number to undersell. But we'll learn more about those two kinds of natural gas turbines in a minute. First of all, look at the prices of natural gas worldwide. Louisiana, three. Japan, 16. So as you can guess, people are building gas liquefaction plants and tankers to basically jet, make use of that arbitrage. Here's a tanker pulling into Japan with natural gas. Since they shut down many of their nuclear power plants, all but one, I think, uh, they have had to import massive amounts of natural gas from around the world. They've changed their balance of payments from positive to negative. The other thing that's likely to happen is to look at the difference in oil prices and natural gas prices in terms of energy content. So that tells you already that wherever we can get rid of oil and substitute natural gas, that's going to happen. So the demand for natural gas is going to go up, and the price is going to go up. And the EIA projects it will go up. So that's why I picked $5 for natural gas. Wind. Wind is great. Wind is uh, no, no fuel cost at all. I just use the same operations cost. Uh, but the problem with wind is that it's kind of expensive, but deceivingly so. First thing to notice is that it's very hard to find the capital investment numbers for these projects. But I got the one for Cape Wind. And if I divide the capacity of the wind farm by the watts that are generated, the, the, the uh, nameplate capacity of the uh, generators, that's $5.80 a watt. But we can only expect the wind turbines to run about 30% of the time. And that's the only time you can recover your capital investment is when the wind is actually generating electricity that you can sell. So instead of being 90% efficient, it's only 30. So that drives the capital cost up by a factor of three. So just to recover the capital cost for Cape Wind would cost about 17.4 cents a kilowatt hour. Remember that today, electricity from Hydro-Quebec or Vermont Yankee or somebody, some outfit like that is about 5 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, we get the benefit of no fuel cost, but it's still pretty expensive for electricity. Now, uh, is that number right? Well. I read as far as I could in the papers about all the negotiations between the um, regulatory body in Massachusetts and these utilities. And basically, they finally agreed and forced the utilities to buy electricity from Cape Wind, if it's ever built, at 16 to 24 cents a kilowatt hour. So they say, wait a minute, why? Well, because we want to be green. Okay, so. So instead of paying five cents a kilowatt hour, the electric utilities in Massachusetts must buy electricity at this price that's escalating over the term of the contract, no matter what. That's the requirement. So I say my model is about right on. That's good. Checks out. Now, this one is an outrageous statement. Okay? Wind turbines increase CO2 emissions. And it's not true in the following circumstance. If you had a nice hydro power source and a wind turbine, uh, then as the wind picked up, you could slow the water uh, flowing out of the reservoir through the hydroelectric plant and make up the power that way. And you can throttle the hydro plant up and down pretty quickly to make up for a loss of power from the wind. But when we look at that more closely, remember there were two kinds of natural gas turbines. The, the, the natural gas combustion turbine is just the jet engine. And the combined cycle turbine is typically two jet engines coupled to a steam boiler, getting that 60% efficiency number. But it takes almost an hour to heat up that steam boiler and get that plant running when you want to turn it on, whereas the natural gas combustion turbine is more like an airplane engine. You throttle it up, and it starts generating electricity pretty quickly. So if you have wind and you need to back it up, 
The only practical backup source, if you don't have hydropower around, is natural gas combustion turbine. So suppose you're a uh, utility and you're given the choice of how to provide 1,000 megawatts of power. One way you could do it, am I missing something here? I'm missing a line on the slide. Um, give me a minute. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this, this is a font size problem. I had it on my computer right and it didn't. So give me just, just a half second because this is an important line. There we go. We'll just look at that for a minute. The, uh, if we had a wind turbine, 30% of the time it wouldn't burn any natural gas. But 70% of the time, the natural gas combustion turbine would be burning the gas at an efficiency of only 29% compared to what you could do with a combined cycle gas turbine. That is, the argument is, why don't we just put in a combined cycle gas turbine and forget the wind turbine because we burn less gas. We don't deplete the gas so fast. So that's the kind of system-wide thinking that's not happening when we say, let's build a wind turbine. Transitions, animations. <laughs> Sorry. Live show. I was smarter myself. Uh, all right, solar electricity. Uh, here's a, uh, a, a, a concentrated thermal solar plant. Uh, this one, we went through the same rigmarole to try and find examples of costs. They're hard to find because typically it's the amount that's guaranteed by the federal government and so on. People don't want you to know how much these things cost so that we can't do these kinds of calculations. And what's important is not what it costs the ratepayer, or not what it costs the taxpayer, or not what it co costs the mistaken investor. What's important is that what it costs the whole society. We need to have our, the most economical energy source to make our society as productive as possible. So uh, capital cost recovery, again, bright source in California, Avangoa in Arizona. These are the prices per watt. Uh, and when we divide, when we then figure out what the capacity factor for solar is, 20% down south, nothing like we have here in Vermont of, or New Hampshire, somewhere around 10%, uh, those are the costs, 22.5 cents. So altogether, 23 cents per kilowatt hour. And then I checked that up against some other uh, sales prices, and sure enough, these companies made deals with their utilities. Albiasa in Spain, uh, 35 cents a kilowatt hour. All Earth Renewables here in Vermont, uh, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. That's what they get from the utility company in order to provide that power. Biomass. Uh, we think of biomass and we think of ethanol and vehicle fuels and so on. Here, I'm just thinking about burning the wood because that's the most efficient use you can make of it. I mean, creating ethanol from it is going to use energy up. So the, the best thing you could do if you were just in, interested in converting biomass to energy is burn it. So here's the plant down on Route uh, 89, exit 12A, Springfield, New Hampshire. And they burn logs that come in, run through a big chipping machine, and they go right into the uh, furnace. Uh, capital cost recovery for them. Uh, uh, I said $4 a watt. I'm going to guess I got two examples of capital costs for new plants. So that would be four cents a kilowatt hour because I assumed 90% uh, duty cycle. The fuel costs I found out by looking at the costs of this fuel delivered lots of places. And it ranges a lot depending upon how far away you have to truck the logs in and uh, the local market. So I picked a number um, somewhere like uh, I think $28. So uh, I'm guessing with this model, 9.7% cents per kilowatt hour. 
OK, so there's the competition. If we want energy from thorium to be cheaper than from coal and all the other competitors, those are the numbers to beat. With the point that just maybe if, if, if gas can really stay down at $3 or $3.50, that might drop to 3.7 cents. If we had gas from combined cycle gas plants, which largely we don't. OK, so those are the numbers to beat. OK, now I'm going to talk about history for a minute. Back in the, the 60s, Alvin Weinberg was the director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And he was also the leader of the project to develop the molten salt reactor. The uh, yellow area in there is the molten salt in a fissile core. The salt is about maybe 500 to 700 degrees centigrade. It is a mixture of lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride. And in that salt solution are dissolved, in his example, uranium fluoride. So the fissile material is, developed, is right in the salt. Then the, the, uh, that hot salt with the fissile material in it goes, circulates around. There's a heat exchanger here that takes that heat out and moves it to a turbine generator to generate electric power. He didn't do that. That is, back in, in the time that he was doing it, they, they hadn't gotten to the stage of putting an electric power generator in. They just uh, basically had a big, big radiator, and they radiated the heat away. So, but it, it did work. He's also a guy who had some insight. He said, look, um, all the CO2 is going to cause global warming. Those papers were published in the, in the 60s and 70s. This is not a, new, a newly found phenomenon. But another thing also happened, and that is a bit earlier even, uh, Glenn Seaborg had a graduate student who was asked to say, what happens if neutrons impinge upon thorium-232? Because uh, they were just exploring what was happening there. And the graduate came back, student came back, he said, it makes uranium-233, a fissile element. And Seaborg said to him, son, you've just made a quadrillion dollar discovery. So. That's, that's that. So the concept here, and it hasn't been built, the only part, only part that was built was the uranium fissile molten salt reactor. But the concept is to use the extra neutrons to breed uranium, I'm sorry, to breed thorium-232 to become 233, and use a kind of a uh, process we'll describe a bit later to basically extract some of that 233 from the thorium that the thorium is also going to be in a salt solution. Same idea. Everything is in a liquid form. So that's the concept. Up at the top, the concept is that you continuously extract the wastes. And that's a hard engineering problem. The easy part is the nobles, gases and noble metals, because you can get those out easily. Uh, the soluble fission products, which are fluorides, uh, are going to remain in solution. And you have to use some fancy chemistry to get them out. Um, so. Anyway, this is a quote from Weinberg's book. He said, the whole energy feature just depends on this. I told you that I just got back, you, heard, you read that I just got back from China. One of the things I discovered while I was there was a brand new edition of Weinberg's autobiography in Chinese, just been translated. There's another form that may get developed first, and it's a little easier to deal with. It's only got a single fluid. It's got the same idea of uranium-232 con being converted to 233, but it all stays in solution. Uh, from a nuclear engineering point of view, there aren't quite enough of your neutrons to keep everybody happy and keep this thing running forever. So you have to keep adding some fissile material, about 20% U-235 or perhaps plutonium and 80% thorium to keep this thing running. If you dilute that with uranium-238, then you get a highly proliferation-resistant reactor because uh, the, the U-238 makes it really unsuitable for weapons use. So the people who are most concerned with weapons proliferation rather like this design better. OK. The question is, OK, how are we going to do that? How is it going to be cheaper than coal? 
Well, I say, first of all, here are seven estimates of projects that were to develop these, uh, a, a first molten salt reactor. And I, you can see I just simply took the cost, divided by the watts generated, and inflated them up to current time. So I say, well, $2 a watt, that's an achievable objective. Let's, let's go with that. So these were first of a kind, by the way. Now, the key technology is not just the thorium, it's the liquid fuel form. That's what makes this reactor inexpensive. It, the liquid has excellent heat transfer, much higher than helium or water or sodium. It's a good way to transfer heat and, and actually has high heat capacity as well. Uh, it provides the opportunity for continuous chemical processing to get the waste products out, because it's a liquid, and similarly to get the new fuel in. It's at atmospheric pressure, so there's no pressure to blow any kind of fissile material into the environment. If it were to spill onto the floor, uh, it solidifies. It's a room temperature solid. Even the fission products like that you heard about that you don't like, like iodine and cesium and strontium, they're all fluorides. They don't, they don't disappear as a gas or a liquid. They become solids in that salt. So we can pretty much contain the contamination under any uh, or most uh, accident conditions. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, right now, we have lots of defense in depth strategies. We can cut those back somewhat. Uh, it's already melted, can't rent, melt down. Its reactivity is stable, but as in all US reactors, in this case, the stability comes because as the salt heats up and expands, the amount of fissile material in the reactor itself is reduced, and the reaction rate drops. So it's uh, thermally stable. There's no propulsive pressure. We were mentioned that. Uh, the uh, folks at Oak Ridge had this concept of a tube from the bottom of the reactor going to a dump tank. And uh, that tube had a little fan on it that blew air across it, which solidified the salt in the tube. And their idea was, in a power failure or any other sort of thing, the fan would fail, the salt would melt, and it would all fall into a non-critical configured tank or series of tanks. There's no big pressure vessel that needs to be erected. That costs a lot of money. It doesn't make quite as many uh, long-lived actinides. Here's a little uh, version of the periodic table. On the horizontal axis are the atomic numbers. On the vertical, the atomic weights. And this is just an example of what happens here. If you had uranium two, thorium-232 irradiated by a neutron, it might absorb it, become thorium-233, and then beta decay, and beta decay, and become uranium-233, which is a fissile material. Now, if you wanted to just leave it in there, hopefully the material fissions and makes useful energy, but some of it might absorb a neutron and in a series of maybe six more absorptions, make one of those higher level actinides like plutonium-239. But the chances of that happening are a lot, a lot less than if you had a uh, U-238 fueled reactor, because it takes only one neutron absorption to make the americium and californium and all those high numbered elements. So there's going to be a little less high-level ways to get rid of. In fact, maybe four orders of magnitude less. Now, all nuclear power plants of all cycles, they all make the same number of fission products, which are you know, the barium and the krypton and so on. But they all decay over a period of a few hundred years to acceptable levels to, to deal with, so you don't have to sequester them so closely. But the questions you have about long storage for waste have to do with the heat that's generated over the long term. So uh, the pressurized water and uranium uh, actinides uh, actually don't decay down to the level of the original ore in the ground until about a million years. Okay, so, but when we get to somewhere around uh, a few hundred years, we're already below the level of natural ore that we started with, uh, with the thorium process. 
The other thing is at the high temperature, we can easily get 700, 750 degrees centigrade output temperature, which means that using fancier uh, Brayton cycles, in this case a triple cycle with continuous reheat here, three stages, you can achieve 45% power efficiency. The more efficiency you get, the less rejected heat. The less rejected heat, the less water cooling or air cooling is needed. Um, if you don't want any water cooling at all, you can have a less, less efficient scheme. This is a open air cycle concept. And here, we just basically compress air from the atmosphere, uh, heat it in the turbine, and uh, generate power from that. Again, no water cooling. So this could be important for areas that uh, are arid. We pay a little bit of a penalty in efficiency, perhaps 40% thermal electric efficiency. There's a new kit on the block, the supercritical turbine, uh, and I'm not really familiar with it. It's been uh, investigated at MIT and at Sandia Labs. Sandia Labs has built lab scale ones. And the point of that is that this scale of sizes is about right, that that supercritical CO2 turbine has the promise of a very low mass and probably a very low cost. Again, a good way to harness the uh, thermal power. Thorium is pretty inexpensive. That's uh, to scale about a one ton size. It could, 500 of those would power the entire US electric system. It only costs about $300,000 a ton. It might actually have a negative cost because it's a nuisance byproduct of rare earth mining. So. The other point is that uh, all nations have some thorium. The, the, there are big deposits in the US, Australia, Brazil, India, and so on, but there's some in every nation, so no nation could be blackmailed for energy security. Every nation could have its own source of energy. Another point is, I'm, what about mass production? If we make these small enough, we can generate them on production lines as Boeing does. Boeing built 477 aircraft last year, and they cost up to $350 million. Compare Boeing's objectives to that of a nuclear power developer, they have the same concerns about life safety, about corrosion, strength of materials, uh, maintenance rec records. It's, it's, they're very similar, and they're, they're high quality manufacturing processes. And it's done at the rate of one a day. So let's make one of these reactors every day. If we do that, then we experience what's called the learning curve. That was discovered about World War II. And it's not a theorem. It's just sort of an observation that if we double the number of units produced in a factory, the experience means that reduce, we reduce the cost by the next one. For most things, it's about 20% less for every doubling. In the IT industry, it's about 50%. University of Chicago estimated only 10% for the nuclear power industry. Uh, again, that's only if you produce the same sort of unit in a production line factory environment. So I say, OK, let's develop those at $2 a megawatt. Let's make them affordable to developing nations so if they don't have the $4 billion to invest. Perhaps a few hundreds of millions could be borrowed from the World Bank. Uh, you, you could have single modules in a few places. Generally, you'd have multi-module configurations, particularly in the US, where site licensing is so hard to get. Uh, transport them by truck. Uh, we're learning now that short transmission lines are important. The long lines are vulnerable to interruption by weather or, or terrorism. OK, so I say, well, we can do it. If we get $2 a watt capital cost, and, and that's two cents a kilowatt hour uh, operations capital cost recovery, then we can do the whole thing for three cents a kilowatt hour. So that's, that's the bogey. That's the objective I see for energy cheaper than from coal from thorium. So we could also help solve our financial crisis by developing a new industry that if they were to build one a day, would be a $70 billion a year industry. And eventually, it would be export oriented. If we did one a day, 
and replace coal plants, here's the curve. Okay? By 2060, you could actually replace all the coal plants in the world. So having solved the global warming problem, <laughs> let's go on to the uh, liquid fuel problem. For, the other thing you can do with high temperature is efficiently separate hydrogen from oxygen in water. And one of the cycles that's used is the so-called sulfur iodine decomposition process. And it gets an efficiency, I think, in excess of 50% uh, to do the separation. Uh, the sulfur and the iodine are just catalysts in this reaction. Uh, you can get away with a less expensive one, uh, a less efficient one at a lower temperature. With hydrogen, you can make ammonia. You can also make methanol, which is a gasoline, gasoline substitute. You can also make dimethyl ether, which is a diesel substitute. Uh, George Ola wrote The Methanol Economy. He's the Nobel Prize winning chemist uh, who got the prize for carbon chemistry. He wrote that book. He's a big advocate of methanol instead of gasoline because we can use the same distribution infrastructure we have today. But maybe you like hydrogen. Uh, you can use hydrogen. Uh, Honda has one. You can buy a hydrogen powered car. There it is, a Clarity. You can only buy it in California because there's only about eight filling stations that you can, you can use. But it's there. Uh, Ford actually did deliver internal combustion engines powered by hydrogen long ago. And so that's possible, too. So hydrogen is a potentially useful fuel. People say it's going to blow up like a bomb. But you know, gasoline is explosive. Uh, I've seen pictures of exploding hydrogen vehicles and gasoline. You know, it's just, it's, neither of them are particularly uh, savory. But you have to compress that hydrogen or liquefy it. And that costs maybe a third of its energy right there to get it down uh, to a form that can be transported at perhaps uh, 5,000 PSI. So that's the energy density of hydrogen at the, the, the density you expect in a tank in an automobile. But you know, ammonia is, uh, you know, doesn't need any pressurization. It's got a higher energy density, as does methanol, as does dimethyl ether. So we can use these other atoms for, uh, for nitrogen and carbon to transport the energy from hydrogen. Let's talk about ammonia for a minute. Between 1 and 2% of all the world's energy, not the electric energy, all of it, is used by the Haber-Bosch process to make ammonia. It's the second largest used chemical industrial chemical. It's mostly used for fertilizers. A third of the people on Earth owe their lives to food that's created and grown with this kind of fertilizer. This is the source, or one of the sources, of the so-called Green Revolution in Africa from 40, 50 years ago. Ammonia. It's an important fertilizer. So we know how to handle it. We've used it. Uh, we can also burn it in a, uh, an internal combustion engine. Uh, here's one at University of Michigan. There's an entrepreneur up in Toronto trying to sell cars this way. It's possible to do. Uh, if you don't like internal combustion, you can create a fuel cell that uses ammonia to generate electricity. Ammonia can be handled safely. We have to pressurize it somewhat, about the same as in a propane tank by your gas, gas grill. Uh, natural gas vehicles run, and hydrogen vehicles would run at much higher pressures. If it spills, well, it's hard to burn it. And you can extinguish a fire with water. Uh, it, it does burn. Uh, it is toxic, more toxic than gasoline. Uh, and here's the example here. But we have a lot of experience handling it. It's the most, second most common industrial chemical. Uh, Low-level exposure isn't a problem because we mammals uh, normally excrete uh, NH3 in, our, in the urea cycle. It is toxic to fish, though, so you have to be careful. Uh, you can also synthesize, you can synthesize ammonia at lab scale so far with a solid-state synthesis system. Here, there's no hydrogen that's liberated first. You just basically have a solid-state 
uh, ammonia synthesizer. And uh, it's, it's a doable technology, but so far only at, at lab scale. Uh, the estimated cost of scaling it up is about 600 kilowatt hours required of electricity per ton of ammonia produced. If I multiply that by 3 cents a kilowatt hour, then I get an interesting number. And that is that the heat of combustion of ammonia times its price, using that formula I just told you, is about a penny a joule. The energy cost of gasoline is about three cents a joule. A joule. It's a third the cost for the energy content. So I say, well, what might that do to the cost of gasoline? Well, I got this from California. They broke down, the state of California, broke down their cost for a $4 gallon, $2.70 is for the crude itself, and 40 cents for the refining. So I said to myself, OK, well, let's, do the, let's tell the refineries to use ammonia instead. Uh, and so the energy cost, the energy content cost, drops from 270 to 90 cents, or about 220 a gallon equivalent. This is making the great leap of faith that the chemical engineers of the world can achieve the same cost for a ammonia refinery as they can for a um, gasoline refinery. Gives you an idea, though. Now, if you don't like ammonia and you didn't like hydrogen, maybe you have to go back to carbonaceous fuels. Uh, but the trick there is to find sources of carbon that are, car cl that are climate neutral, which means we can't dig it out of the ground and burn it. We have to get it out of the air somehow. And uh, here's one project. Green Freedom has an alkaline collection pond here, with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Uh, no, not hydroxide, carbonate and here. And his idea is to, in the cooling tower of the power plant, heat up that solution. And when you heat sodium bicarbonate, it becomes sodium carbonate. That's how baking soda works. It makes little CO2 bubbles. Baking powder works, pardon me, baking powder. Uh, and so capture the CO2 and try and uh, use it to make methanol and make gasoline. Uh, he estimated about $4 a gallon for gasoline. Uh, it's a big project, though. There's billions of dollars of investment to pull us off. If you go to thoriumapplications.com, there's a, uh, a guy who's uh, got some other ideas about how to do this. Now, we can get carbon from other carbon sources. Right now, we talk a lot about biomass for energy production. But I say, wait a minute, let's use the biomass not to burn it, but to get the carbon out of it. That's what we need to make these fuels. And typically, you get about three tons of biomass per acre per year. Half of that's carbon. I say, Don't burn it. Run it through some fancy process to add hydrogen and make a liquid fuel. With that, we can get, according to one of the papers, about that much fuel out of that, a ton of biomass. There are other options, too. The other options are cattle dung. In India, we burn cattle dung for power. Uh, there's a lot of cattle dung in the world. You could make more fuel than the US uses just with the cattle dung that exists. And there are other similar sources. So I summarize phase one of the talk. I got 10 minutes to go. <laughs> with here's my set of advantages for implementing thorium energy cheaper than coal. About two years ago, I was invited here after I got an article put in this magazine called uh, Liquid Fluoride Thorium Reactor. The magazine is American Scientist. And I was hoping to influence people in the US to begin to investigate this technology more. But I had an unanticipated side effect, and that was that people outside of the US read it. This man, Jiang Mianheng, is the son of the former president of China. He has been the leader of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, he read the article. He, went, he brought his people to Oak Ridge. They learned what had happened in the molten salt reactor experiments at that time. That was late in. Uh, uh, 2010, 
in the beginning of 2011, the government of China announced that they are going to develop this technology. Okay, there's the, 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 there you are. It's a long-term project. They were explicit to tell us that most of the people on the project are young engineers, not the old guys. Uh, and they expect to have the molten salt fuel reactor by 2020. They have an intermediate stage, for those of you who know about pebble bed reactors, earlier in, the 25th, in 2015. So that's what's, that's what's happening in China now. Here's what he probably learned about at Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, in this time, from 65 to 69, actually built this molten salt reactor. No, nothing to do with thorium, just plain uranium in the molten salt. And it was made of graphite. The salt flowed through the channels. The graphite reflected neutrons back and kept the mixture critical. Um, here's a sort of schematic diagram of how it works. Those are the kinds of uh, successes they had in, uh, in, in that experiment. So they proved that this is a practical technology. And they ran it for years, 17,000 hours. And uh, there are some lessons about material science to be learned from the uh, autopsy of the, uh, of the reactor tank. So I'm hoping this kind of technology interests engineers like you. Uh, here's a picture of one of the Oak Ridge uh, reactors. Uh, and I've told you how easy it is, but I'm going to tell you for a minute how hard it is, because <laughs> you need the challenge. Uh, one is, uh, this technology was used by the Pebble Bed Reactor Project in South Africa. Uh, they used helium as the cooling, as, as the heat transfer fluid. Uh, but it was really difficult for them to make that work. They overspent their budget on the triple reheat Brayton cycle, and that contributed to uh, basically bankrupting the project. So it's been put in, in mothballs right now. So people are rethinking that. Maybe they should use just nitrogen. Uh, the advantage of helium in that particular environment was that in a pebble bed reactor, helium is not only neutral chemically, it's neutral um, Neutronically, it doesn't convert to some other element. Uh, the open air Brayton cycle needs, that's good, but there's a problem, not a problem, there's a challenge. The challenge is uh, it's a mature ch technology. You know, we've been working on those for airplane engines for decades, half a century. And if you go out and buy a new jet engine for a jetliner, you can buy that for 29 cents a watt. That's pretty cheap. Okay, that's, that's the basis of the power conversion technology in a nuclear power plant. That's good. But here we have to have something a little different. We have to heat the air uh, with molten salt rather than just burning the fuel. So there's a lot of work to be done there. But this idea was designed before. Even before the molten salt reactor experiment, there was the aircraft reactor experiment, which ran for 100 hours and led to the design of this particular reactor, which was built to run on an airplane wing, 1.4 meters in diameter, you see, and a beryllium sphere to re reflect the neutrons back in. And the heat transfer agent was sodium, I'm sorry, yeah, sodium and potassium metals mixed together, to f which are a fluid. Uh, flowing in these pipes. So somebody knows how to transfer that heat from uh, a flow to a, a jet engine. They never built this. <laughs> uh, what do you need? Well, I think we need materials engineering. We need chemistry. We need physics. There weren't nuclear scientists, really, at the time. Uh, it's, a, it's the chemist reactor. We, we talk about nuclear chemistry. That's the challenge, is to know how all these different uh, fission products work. And the, the, the higher numbered elements, like plutonium and uranium and so on, have so many valence states that the chemistry is tough. Uh, I underlined a couple of the important ones, just to remind myself to tell you that those things which you read about as polluting the ground in places near Chernobyl and so on, in this kind of reactor, are really fluorides. And the fluorides don't vaporize. They're solid. They stay within the uh, reactor area. And so, but you have to deal with them. You have to know the chemistry. Luckily, a lot of them are very similar. Makes it easier. 
The other problem we have is that that thing was built of graphite, not metal. Graphite is a good structural material. Uh, pyrolytic graphite does not burn, like at Chernobyl. Um, and the, but the problem is the structural material swells with neutron irradiation and then shrinks. Uh, people are thinking of ways to have self-healing materials now, which I don't really understand very well. Uh, but there's an opportunity to discover better structures for carbon uh, that could be formed as structural elements here. Um, you know, you can use standard stainless steel for hot salt, just as long as it doesn't have a lot of fissile material in it. You can use hastaloy uh, for salts that have all these fission products in it, but not in the core of the uh, reactor because you don't want the nickel in the hastaloy to absorb neutrons. Uh, another new technology you've seen a lot about is silicon carbides. They can be very strong at high temperatures. So the higher the temperature, the more efficient the reactor. So there's a lot of opportunity for research in silicon carbide for, for heat exchangers. Uh, the process of separating the uranium from the thorium is kind of simple in a way. Uh, all, what you do is you, you depend upon the fact that uranium has at least two valence states. You can have uh, uranium fluoride four or, or uranium fluoride six. So you take the uranium that's in solution here as UF4 and you add fluorine gas to it. That makes uranium F6, uranium hexafluoride, but it doesn't do anything to the thorium because the thorium's only got that one valence state. Then you get the uranium fluoride six here back to UF4 by passing hydrogen through it. So there's a way to do that. That's called fluoride volatility. So if you ever see that word, that's the name of that process. The other side is harder. And I'm not going to go into that because I don't really understand it. There's a lot of work to be done to try to figure out how to continuously remove the waste products. If you don't want to remove them continuously, you can do that. In a single fluid reactor, you can just leave most of them in there and run it for 20 or 30 years. And then either ship the, way, the, the fluid out to a reprocessing center or even discard it. But uh, it's, it's a, a, another challenge. Uh, some of these challenges in chemistry can be met with computers. High-speed computers can model what's happening at an atomic level in, in these, these fluids. Here's a guy who, in, in Oxford who is doing these kinds of modeling for lithium fluoride and for uh, beryllium fluorides with dissolved thorium in this case. So it's possible to do that. For example, here's what he discovered. Here's his model, and here's what's predicted. So he, He's got a good idea. His model is, is, is perhaps accurate. Now, there's another big problem, and that is refineries. How big is a refinery? This is the biggest one in the, world, in the US, and it's down in Texas somewhere. And what we talk about Vermont Yankee, 600 megawatts, 0 0.6 gigawatts. A refinery generates 40 gigawatts of energy in the form of uh, chemical potential energy. So they're really big. There's a lot of work to be done to figure out how to scale up to that level. I fiddled around with it myself and said, well, suppose I just used a, this simple technique to make hydrogen and then presume that I had a 50% efficiency for hydrogen manufacturing and a 50% efficiency for fuel manufacturing. Uh, you know, to knock off a billion dollars of imports at one a day building these things would take 11 years. So someone's got to figure out how to do this better or do less of it uh, in order to succeed. So there, there you are. There's the challenge for your next career. And you can begin by reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's available at the back of the room. It's $25 on Amazon, and it's $20 uh, from my lovely wife in the back. <laughs> you have questions, please. The Chinese are not time constrained. 
They want to do it right. They want to understand it thoroughly. They're starting off very simply. Their, their initial molten salt loop is, not, is simply uh, uh, um, potassium nitrate and, and sodium nitrate, simple salts that they can deal with, the same ones that are used in uh, thermal storage. So they're, part of their plan is to train people. That's why most of their people are so young. So they're going to, they have a, uh, uh, sort of a progress plan, but no deadlines. They want to make sure that it's all done, done right. Uh, China has a lot of initiatives going on about energy, right? They've got uh, fast reactors being imported from Russia. They've got uh, uh, pressurized water reactors from Areva and from Westinghouse being built. This is one of those initiatives in China. What would Areva or Westinghouse do to object to this? Yeah. Well, f they would say we're having a lot of trouble just selling what we've got. Now, the power plants that they're selling are competitive. I mean, they can generate electricity at maybe eight or nine cents a kilowatt hour, and that's good enough. The price of uranium is still low, and it's going to be low for decades. There's plenty of uranium for the near term. So they would say, well, let's just make money on what we know how to build. Uh, so meanwhile, we got Westinghouse, who basically has the market almost locked up in large scale reactors. And we have other companies who are trying to build small modular reactors like New Scale or Hyperion or um, uh, Babcock and Wilcox, who are trying to say, well, let's try and get a lower cost market entry point. And again, but they're using technologies that they know and that have been uh, presented to the NRC, and it makes it possible to license them. One of the biggest problems you'd have trying to build a reactor like this in the US is getting the NRC to approve it, because the NRC would have to learn a lot about it. I think the total budget of the NRC is something like 600 million or 500 million. Most of that's funded by nuclear power plants that exist. They pay, a, I don't know, 100 million each. No, no, <laughs> no, no. But it's several million each, and they also uh, get money by uh, having to respond to questions. So if you say to the NRC, uh, "Can I change this filter screen?" They'll say, "Okay, we'll look at that, and we'll charge you two hundred and seventy dollars an hour while our staff looks at it." We have, if you're looking at that for a brand new design, we're talking tens or fifty or hundred million dollars. We don't know just for the NRC to learn enough about it to say yes or no. We, we, we couldn't buy them and import them to the US without NRC approval. Are there any other detractors or um, we could be up? What are the other detractors? Um, well, there's a lot of engineering to be done on the waste disposals yet. Uh, how, to, how to put it in glass and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that's a concern. Um, the materials challenges, I think, and that includes the one I just talked about, glass, those are the biggest challenges. Nuclear chemistry and materials engineering. Wait a minute, let's get another. Did, go. So her question has to do with how about cleaning up that molten salt? And that's what that waste processing system should do. You're going to have to have some continuous reprocessing to get out partic particles. You dump the stuff that just bled off, and then you put in some new, is what I'm trying to say. Instead of having a complex chemical system to clean the stuff that bled off, why don't you just say, oh, that was, that was bad, buy, and put it in new? Per perhaps you could do that. Perhaps you could just incrementally discard some and put new in. Okay. Uh, uh, you make a comment if it's important for people to understand it. The whole process for making aluminum has been around since the late 1880s. It uses uh, cryolite, which is liquid fluoride salt process. They do not dump it. They, they clean it. They recycle it. Because the, uh, the aluminum oxide that's dissolved it is uh, electrolyzed out, diluted, so it's recycled. It 
there's no need to dump it. Now, that, granted, that's a chemical process. The second comment I want to make, uh, why the pebble bed, fluidized pebble bed reactor is not likely to make it is because of much of the technology involves using helium as the coolant. Helium is not in huge supply, particularly if you talk about the number of nuclear plants that have to be built. The United States actually has a 15% storage capacity of its net helium, but we probably own the world's monopoly because we get it out of natural gas wells. Until we learn how to do fusion uh, <laughs> processing to generate helium on this planet, it's going to be in short supply. It's, you know, and I think that's, uh, that, that's an important concept. And I think the third, just to close, is that if you start building a lot of uranium reactors, there really isn't enough uranium unless you go to breeders. Look it up. You can see that there's a lot of analysis that without breeder reactors, the uranium supply for the multiple nuclear power plants is not uh, possible. Well, thank you, uh, Bob. And if you would like to ask him more questions, I'd like to see him. Thank right. You. Thank you.